It's time for another Ask GC Anything where we get to answer all your questions about cycling to the best of our ability. Well, at least as many as we can. Let's start off straight away with this one from B Tanken. Uh, how do you maintain bike fitness when you are out traveling without a bike? Hashtag talk back. Uh, I'll get us started on this because recently I've been a bit time constrained and I've also been in places where I haven't had access to a bike. So I've been doing a little bit of running. Yeah, sorry. Uh, but all you need for that are some trainers, a t-shirt and some shorts, depending on the weather. And I have found that you can get a very good workout in in the space of 30 minutes, maybe even less. And I think it has helped me keep a lot of my cycling fitness when I've had periods of time where I can't actually ride my bike. But one word of warning, if you are someone that generally does almost all cycling, be aware that you can sometimes pick up a few little niggles and injuries if you do too much running. Sounds like you're talking from experience there, Dan. I am, yeah. I've, had, I've done it for about three months and had about five or six injuries, I think. Well, that's a pretty good strike, right? <laughs> yeah, personally, I will do whatever I possibly can to ride a bike or some type of bike. So I was recently, I don't know whether I told you this, Dan, I was recently in Taipei at the Taipei Cycle Show. Maybe I did mention it. Uh, and our hotel there didn't have a particularly great exercise bike, but I used what there was there and I stuck a GCN training video on my phone uh, in a plastic bag, so I didn't sweat through it, and I stuck it on the front of the bike and I absolutely battered myself senseless for 20 minutes and 25 minutes respectively, uh, just enough to clear my head and give me a bit of a workout. One thing that neither of us do, pretty clearly in fact, is swim. However, we have it on good authority from Richie Port, in fact, that that is really potentially very good for your cycling fitness and he does it quite a bit. So if you check that video out there, that is, is his secret training. And you get to see Matt in speedos as well, which is, you know. Don't put them off. Sorry. It's something that I always did, swimming. I mean, uh, you know, it's just, it's, you know, you're coming from a cycling, into a cycling world, sorry, and it's like, you know, they, you shouldn't swim because it builds your upper body and this yeah. and that, but that's a bit of a wise tale, old wise tale, to be honest. Like, I mean, if you can, do a recovery session in the pool, it's just as effective as, you know, doing an easy ride on the road, in my opinion. Well, moving swiftly on from Matt wearing Speedos to another question. This one sent in on Twitter by Emma Davids, and she has asked, what's the difference between mountain bike and road cleats, and why? Road cleats just seem difficult to walk on. And yeah, that is pretty much true, they are. Uh, so the difference is that mountain bike cleats are designed to be able to walk on, so they are recessed into the shoe, so the tread of the shoe comes down on either side, and that obviously means that they have to be much, much smaller. So they're tiny little metal things, uh, which means that they can be kind of hidden in the sole of the shoe. Uh, and then also, the design means that the pedal is better able to deal with mud. So if you are walking around, and you pick up loads of mud on your shoes, and then you go and step back in, a road pedal is going to be much harder to get back into, whereas a mountain bike pedal should be much easier. Yeah, we do feel your pain now. It doesn't matter how big cycling gets in various nations around the world and people get used to seeing you in Lycra, uh, nothing really gets them used to seeing you walking down the road <laughs> in a set of road cleats. Uh, but as Simon mentioned, the cleats are small, and the fact that they're smaller does mean that the interface between the cleat and the pedal is also smaller, which does make a very slight difference in power transfer and efficiency. However, unless you're trying to embark on winning the Tour de France, for example, you're probably not going to feel that much of a difference. Uh, next up is a video in which I explain the various pedal choices which are available to you, of which there are quite a few, like these. Now, normally road-specific pedals are one-sided, which means you can only clip in that side and not that side, which makes it ever so slightly more finicky, as some co-presenters know, to actually clip into the pedals. Now, these, as you can see, I've got a rather large base and platform, which means that there's very little energy loss between the power that you're putting through your legs and that which is going through to the cranks, which is a good thing, out on the road. All right, quick fire round now. And first up, we've got this from Johannes left under last week's video. Why are the tips of triathlon and time trial saddles cut off, so like shorter, while it's not the case for normal road bike saddles? Now, the reason is that when you're leaning really far forward uh, on a time trial bike or triathlon bike to get more aerodynamic, that basically means that your hips move forward as well. And so your natural tendency, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, is to shuffle forward in the saddle. So triathletes will actually find that they're sitting almost over the bottom bracket. And whilst roadies aren't allowed to do that, having a shorter saddle means that actually the bit you sit on ends up closer to the handlebars. So you can effectively get a more comfortable position. 
uh, and they're probably more comfortable as a result, aren't they? Yeah, I think that's correct. It's to do with the UCI's regulations on positioning. Like, you have to be about five centimetres, I think it is, behind the bottom bracket if you drop a plumb line. But as you said, you do rotate forwards and it's not particularly comfortable sometimes on the tip of a normal road saddle. Uh, next up, Mark Everson asks a few questions. We're going to read out the last one. Uh, why do they hold races on cobbles when everyone hates riding on cobbles? <laughs> Good question, uh, but at the same time there probably aren't that many people who like to ride up mega long climbs or super steep climbs. I know some of you will do, but not flat out like the pros do. And likewise they don't like riding on cobbles particularly, but that's kind of what cycling and elite level sport is about, pushing the limits isn't it, and becoming kind of hard men of the sport. And we love watching the riders race over cobbles and I love racing on cobbles, yeah. even though they're hard. Yeah, bike riding is good when it's hard sometimes, yeah. isn't it? Basically. Yeah, in so, retrospect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, pretty much. All right, next up, we have got this one from Beast, uh, who is Jarvis de Jose. Uh, my wrists and fingers hurt if I ride for longer than two hours. Do I need to change my saddle position or get a longer stem? Well, bike fit is a big, big topic. But in a nutshell, you should not adjust your saddle. So saddles should always be set up so that you have the most efficient and comfortable pedaling position and then everything else is adjusted around that so i would suggest that if you've got sore wrists and numb hands that actually a long stem is definitely the wrong thing to do you probably want to come a little bit shorter and a little bit higher to take pressure off your wrists so uh, so yeah look for a shorter stem and possibly put it up a little bit and that might well cure your problem yeah it's not just bike positioning though is it you can do things to dampen the vibration like bigger tires run out of softer pressure extra layers of grip tape using uh, padded mitts etc so there's plenty of stuff that you can do and we have got videos on that. Next up from Mark on Twitter, is it bad etiquette to take a bead on from a different team in the feed zone? Uh, well, if you haven't kind of pre-warned the swan you <laughs> stood with it, I would say yes, sir. If you just, just suddenly theft. grab it when there's a rider from that team uh, who wants to about to take it from behind, then yes, you probably shouldn't be doing that. But that is one of the good things about cycling, that if you are desperate for a bottle, you've missed yours or your swan is not in the feed zone for whatever reason, then if you do kind of plead and just say, can I have one, often they'll hand one over to you. And it's the same in the race, actually, as well. Yeah. You sometimes see riders pass over a gel if somebody on another team is in desperate need. Yeah, and team cars as well can hand out bottles, can't they? So, uh, yeah, just don't nick it, basically, is the, the golden rule. Uh, right then, Uzziah Lim. Uh, hey, GCN, I'm a climber, but how do I win a flat stage in a sprint? Well, you've definitely asked the wrong people there. Did you ever win a flat stage in a sprint, Dan? No. No, me neither. Uh, I suggest, actually, uh, that you look to one of our videos, perhaps sprinting with Mark Cavendish or Marcel Kittel, but I would say, that the main thing to do is to so-called keep your powder dry for as long as possible. So hide in the wheels, do as little work as you possibly can so you're as fresh as possible for the sprint and then you've got to sprint as hard as you possibly can and that's the point at which being able to sprint really fast definitely comes in useful. Yeah, we've got those tips from Kittle and also from Mark Cavendish. Kittle says how to train for the sprints. Mark Cavendish on our video shows you how to sprint in a race. So they're well worth watching if you want to get better. Uh, the problem that we had, or I had especially, was that I was a non-climber that struggled to get up climbs and a non-sprinter that struggled in the sprint. Uh, which leads us on to our next question from Tom McLaughlin. What is the definition of a chopper? <laughs> and when is it okay to call someone in it? Well, you're kind of looking at the definition right now. I don't know how you define a chopper. I thought a chopper is someone that uh, is kind of doesn't look right on a bike. So they, you know their riding style might not be very aesthetically pleasing, or you know they do something that's not pro. So actually, it's not a very nice thing to call someone. And also, it's just it's just not very cool to use that word, is it? Because you know they, they might just be starting out they may just love riding a road bike anyway so it doesn't really matter what they look like so yeah use the word sparingly because it's a little bit arrogant isn't yeah, it and what's so. the difference between chipper and chopper i don't know mate no You're, maybe he's a chipper he's a chopper um, yeah, I've got no idea. There actually. may well be somebody out there who has proper definitions of the two. So if you have, please leave them in the comments section down below. We, 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 we need to define these, don't we? I think chipper they're probably regional. Chopper. You know, a chipper is probably. I think that's a British term, isn't it? And right. Chopper, I think, is it? I think it's isn't it Australian. Oh, well, we're uncertain. It's chopper. Let us know. Yeah, yeah. Right then, last question. I'm afraid this one sent in by Archie White on Twitter, and he's asked: uh, Does over time your heart rate decreasing and your power staying the same mean that you're either getting fitter or more fatigued? That is a good question, isn't it? Dan, how do you interpret the signs? Well, it is a difficult one because it could mean either. 
couldn't it, really? Yeah. Uh, what we need to look at, though, are the trends over an extended period of time. So if from one day to the next, your heart rate is a lot lower for, in terms of the same power, it might well be that you're suffering a little bit from fatigue. So you want to look over the course of maybe even two months and see what your heart rate for a given power is at the same kind of freshness. Because you've also got to bear in mind it's not just fatigue that can play a part in your heart rate levels. Mine tended to come down when I was slightly tired. Yeah, mine I think some people do find it slightly elevated when they're tired. I don't think everybody's the same. But also things like the temperature outside, how hydrated you are, whether or not you've had caffeine, stress levels, how much sleep you've been getting. There are so many factors which can affect it. So you can't look at two individual days. You need to look at the trends, as I said, over a good period of time. Yeah, I think the good thing about fatigue if there is one, is that actually you can tell when you're tired, not just through your heart rate, because like Dan said, your heart rate is open to loads of other variables, but actually ask yourself the simple question, do you feel tired? Are you sluggish on the bike? Do you suffer from increased muscle soreness or poor sleep? All those kind of things can be absolute telltale signs that you are suffering from fatigue. But then coming back to that point about measuring yourself over a period of time, there is no better way and everyone should really do it and that is testing your fitness every now and then so that you really know whether you are getting fitter or not because just looking at power values from training is a pretty good indicator but you need to really test yourself. So if you need to know how, this video behind me tells you exactly what to do to measure your FTP which is a pretty good indicator of form. The first couple of minutes are going to feel slightly easy and we're going to wait for the effort to come to us. At 10 to 15 minutes, your effort is really going to start to bite. And at this point, you can kind of gauge how hard you can try. Ah, and then at the end of your hour, you're going to be in the absolute box. Right, well, that's all we have time for this time around on Ask GC Anything. Don't forget, if you've got any questions of your own that you would like answered, you can leave them in the comments section down below or on Twitter with the hashtag TalkBack. Yeah. Now, firstly, you need to make sure that you subscribe to GCN. If you haven't already, it's very simple. Just click on the globe. And then we're going to recommend some more content now because we're pretty excited, aren't we? It's Paris Bay week. Oh, yeah, one of the best races on the calendar. So we've got a couple of videos for you to check out. Yeah, a couple of hundred riders going to be wondering why cycling sends them over brutal cobbles, as Mark <laughs> Everson alluded to earlier. But yeah, down here is our big GCN Paris Bay preview show where we go through the course, a few of the rides, what we think might happen, and predict who we think might win. <laughs> and down in the other corner are our top 10 riders to watch out for at the race. Hopefully, we'll have picked a winner this time.